And again, even though, uh, what is it, like, horror and stuff isn't my primary thing, I still will dabble in read a bit of it in order to help that particular wheelhouse gain a little bit of um, attention here on the, uh, the YouTubes. Because, as we all know, uh, BookTube really enjoys covering a whole lot of um, traditionally published YA. So, without further ado, the report of Mr. Charles Amers. And again, forgive me if I butcher anybody's name. Like always, Florida woman absolutely is um, a special case when it comes to the English language. But, like with anything else, uh, this starts off with kind of like what you expect out of like one of those older style, kind of more pulpy horror mysteries where the character sends a letter and to kind of like draw you into the story a bit. And it, I honestly think letter correspondence is a pretty effective way to get a little bit of information out before the story starts proper. So that way you can have the reader's eye drawn to what you want through the character's observations, even if it's something as quick as a letter. You know, again, just my personal preference. This is the reason why I like to open up with quotes in my own stuff, because it's a way to sprinkle on the um, the information but without basically taking uh, 90 to 100 pages to get to a point you know like w with certain kinds of books nowadays but not only is this opening framing device used but some of the vocabulary it is a touch more archaic than what you're used to with you know modern how you say that word vernacular <laughs> see look Florida woman's trying to bring out a thesaurus oh my goodness but it is pretty funny. Like, the way he's telling it initially, yeah, he opens with the letter. And then he's kind of recounting everything, almost kind of like a journal entry after the fact. That's also what I liked about Pinkerton's ghost setup as well. So, you know, hey, you're in good company here, Mr. Charles. You know, because I know... <laughs> And I apologize if later I, I butcher everybody's names again. It's just a thing. I try to pronounce things and I totally blew it. <laughs> but yes, uh, all matter of creepy and crawly is, is coming out in this particular setup. But it isn't done in such a way where it's like the newer style um, paranormal romance meets monsters Nope, this is your old school pulp monster kind of setup where it invokes more of um the classic silent films kind of monsters. So there you go. Th that, that, that's that's my two cents for this little portion right here. Oh, and for you Arthurian enthusiasts out there, there is some allusion to this within some of the opening pages of this particular setup which you wouldn't quite expect in a book that it has a little bit more horror elements but I've noticed that within certain sections of Pulp Rev and everywhere else everybody's trying to bring their own uh, two, two cents to the massive wheel that is Arthurian legend which you know what it is a bit refreshing because in today's climate you don't really see too much um, you know, call back to that particular setup, you know, noble knights slaying the evil monster and everything, and maybe, maybe a little bit of Beowulf, from the looks of it, but yeah, you, you get the, the, it's like, it's like having three or four little stories within one segment here, you got the opening letter, then you have him kind of doing a narration through kind of like a journalistic format, and then he's like, oh, I have to kind of explain this to you. But it doesn't take, you know, that's the thing. When it comes to exposition, you can make it, you know, somewhat more elaborate if you want to. But as long as you're going at a pretty good clip speed, I'll pay attention. Um, and, it, yeah, he basically, he knows how to use all these various words. And I am indeed, you know what, uh, impressed. Yes, I would have to say impressed, just because I know my word variation isn't as robust right now, but I'm more concentrating on, you know, with this fourth draft to get, like, 
must get story to the end. Don't worry, I'll re I can re-edit things later. But here, yeah, even though he has kind of like a more courtly kind of verbose setup, it kind of fits, especially with the whole a bit more gothic bent. Just like he says in his his opening bits before the letter, you know, as like what influenced him to write this particular um, anthology and everything else. But yeah, it it's it's poetic, but without overstaying its welcome, like most more purple prose does. Which again, an example of that I could give is Sword of Truth and Wheel of Time. And even the Rhapsody series by Elizabeth Hayden, that had very lyrical purple prose all over the place, like if you want an example. But I've noticed even with um, certain kinds of gothic horror, they have a tendency to go a bit verbose, which, you know what, as far as reader expectations go, yeah, when you're getting into something like that, you're going to have a lot more word usage. <laughs> and as you go through... Uh, more of the the particular stories in this anthology he keeps taking like um segments of different people's lives and then kind of like just inserting in like where do you want to start this tale some tales start from the beginning some are written from the perspective of a much older version of the character it, it goes off in a few different directions but that's what you can enjoy about anthologies it gives you a taste of what the writer wants to do and you as the reader you can pick and choose which ones you might reread over again and to me yeah I think there is a value in reading outside your wheelhouse again I personally prefer a lot of pew pew in science fiction but certain elements of other kinds of stories can be woven into your own books as well personally I find it fun be to look at like Man, how many different words should I look at, and how can I, <laughs> how can I see what this means? Because again, I used to be a lot more of an avid reader when I was younger and had more uh, time, but most of these stories will run about twenty to thirty pages, and you know what? You can read it in a sitting or two, um, but I do like the more fantastical elements. I think there should be a place for fantasy, you know mixed in with horror. Uh, so if your whole, if you honestly want to get a bit of that old style gothic horror meets a bit of the fantastic elements, kind of like the old weird tales of old, which even, um, which even uh, Robert E. Howard did a few cracks at, you know, Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos, uh, which I was listening to a podcast of that a few days ago. I would say definitely give this a, uh, a try. The Report of Mr. Charles Amers and Other Tales and Stories. Um, I would say uh, if you really want to, you can take a look at the sample. The sample is pretty generous. You can tell whether or not you'll, you'll be interested in reading more of it just based on most samples alone. In general, I usually give a book you know, two, two to three chapters most times to to catch my eye sometimes up to five chapters but with anthologies yeah you can tell pretty quick like what kind of stories you want and sometimes that is definitely a good way to discover new people so I hope you all have a good evening and I will link this uh, book collection below thank you and good night uh, PS I actually liked the black twerk demon you know because so far I've read four of the different stories in this but yeah, the the fact that this guy, from the very first sentence, was so put upon, I, Sir Goswin, struggled long while deciding whether to write about this macabre secrets and horrific details of my blasphemous existence. With a soul stained by hubris, I still call myself a knight. Would this terrifying story only bring an unfathomable calamity and pestilence to anyone who reads it? It's like... Man, is this poor knight like the holder of the Necro Comic Con or something? <laughs> that poor man! <laughs> what happened to you, my dear sir?